Hello and welcome into the Wednesday, August 3rd edition of the Locked on These Podcasts. I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. And today we're going to be asking three burning questions that we have for the Maple Leafs to the rest of the offseason. So I'm going to get right to it, Dave. You listen to the Locked on These Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your Locked On Maple Leafs, your daily podcast on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On at Least podcast. You want to shop for all things Leafs. I'm your host, Mike DiStefano from TV. TSN 1050 Toronto Radio, also known as Al's brother on TSN's Overdrive and TSN 1050's Leafs Lunch. Joining me, it's my co-host Dave Morris, Studi from Sportsnet, also writer for the NHLPA. Locked on Leafs, a daily Maple Leaf centric podcast, so be sure to subscribe for free. Wherever you get your podcasts from, you can also now catch us up on video format on YouTube to search up Locked on Leafs on YouTube. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Dave, what's going on, pal? It's been a couple of days since we've uh, since we've hopped back onto the podcast. It's the summertime. We've come down to just three episodes a day. So, you know, what you've been up to the last few days? We haven't been able to chat since the weekend. You enjoy yourself? Yeah, just going through a little bit of withdrawal with the hockey news. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, yeah. There was a couple of things that kind of sprinkled out there throughout the weekend. I mean, we did see uh, John Klingberg on Friday. He finally signed a contract going to the sunshine uh, of Anaheim. I was going to say Sunshine State, but that's Florida, isn't it? Yeah, it's so that's yeah, so not the Sunshine State, but going to the Sunshine down in Anaheim in California, sign him with the Ducks. Interesting move. And then uh, I don't know if you saw this report from David Pagnata yesterday about mm-hmm. uh, a one Nazem Kadri reportedly very close to maybe figuring something out with the New York Islanders and Lou Lamorello. And then there's all these conspiracy theories saying that we're not going to hear anything about Nazem Kadri because there's a contract already signed, tucked away in a top drawer, hasn't been filed to registry yet, and it'll happen uh, the day before camp. We'll all just see Nazem Kadri at camp, and it won't get leaked at all throughout the rest of the summer, apparently. But I guess a, a contract is already signed. This is what people believe. Um, and because it's Lou Lambrello, it's kind of believable. It's kind of believable. And then yesterday the report came out from David Pagnotter a couple of days ago um, from the fourth period talking about how eh, there could be some fire there. There's there's some talks between Kadri's camp and the New York Islanders. And that's an interesting fit, uh, interesting fit for Nas, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I kept thinking that he was holding out for the Colorado Avalanche to make room for him. It, it for what it makes, it seems like maybe it's just his demands are too much for Colorado, or they just they don't want to make the trade to move players' contracts out in order to make the room for him because it might weaken their team to the point where it doesn't make sense. But the Islanders would have to do the same thing. Yeah, and I'm very look. We saw what Lou Lamarillo did when he traded Devon Taves to the Colorado Avalanche. So if I'm an NHL team and Lou Lamarillo is offering up a player. I know sometimes people think scary Lou. Uh, I don't think the Colorado Avalanche were, were speaking that when they got Devontae's for what was it, two second round picks. Oh yeah. Basically nothing. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But I, I was taking a look at the roster today and an easy fix would be Nick Palmieri. Like I know he's got a, a you know, some more term on his contract, but if they can get the 5 million bucks and get out of that contract, that would give them roughly $16 million to get both. Him, Nazem Kadri signed, and get Noah Dobson, who's currently an RFA, get him signed back under contract, and then I think they would be good. But until they get you know some money off the books, they can't really do that. I don't think they can, and maybe that's the reason why we also haven't seen um, Kadri's deal 
kind of come through because they haven't been able to make those moves yet. And they are still kind of working on things. I don't know who knows, but that was the, the latest report on Nazem Kadri, who still is a, a UFA and is out there on the markets. We think most likely still out on the market at the very least. Um, and then we saw Andrew Mangiapani signing himself an extension, sticking around with, uh, with, with the Calgary flames and, I got to tell you, man, things are looking a lot better in Calgary than they were three weeks ago. A lot better. Yeah, you thought you were going to be coming out bad on the Matthew Kachuk trade. You get a guy who was almost equal to, well, has scored more points than him in Jonathan Huberto. You got a top four defensive McKenzie Weger. You get Andrew Majapai assigned to a deal that I like a lot, like $5.8 million over three years. Manjapani is a very important player to that team. He's a player that a lot of people would like to have on their team. So, like, that's good. And then uh, Alan Walsh kind of confirmed the uh, Ellie Freeman's report that Huberto and uh, Bradshaw Living had a little sit down together to the, you know, we know what the, what was discussed there. It wasn't just, uh, hey, how you doing? It's more of a, yeah. hey, what's it going to take to keep you around? Because we don't want this to be a one one and done sort of deal. What do you think would have been on the menu for that meeting? Whether it was a dinner or a lunch, but what would have been on the table, you think? A nice, is that a steak dinner type of thing you're going to? Or are you going to like, it's, you know, Montreal smoked meats, huh? you know, in town, you go to a nice smoked meat shop. Like, what do you think was, uh, was the situation there? Well, you know, Brad Chilov is going with whatever the heck Huberto wants to go to. But I'm thinking if I'm Huberto, you're going to milk your GM for the top of the line, whatever you can get, right? So you're, you're going to the tom- tomahawk steak, please. Yeah. Oh, and oh, you got caviar that goes with that? Oh, yeah. I mean, Brad, <laughs> we want some. Ca- we can't. We got to do this right, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That'll be interesting. I mean, if they can get him locked up long term, uh, absolutely. Things went from bad to worse to, hey, things might not be too bad after all. From Goudreau leaving to Chuck demanding a trade out. And now you look at the moves that have been made afterwards like, eh, we still might be competitive in the Pacific Division here. Don't think that we're ready to throw in the towel which I think is quite interesting. Uh, but outside of that, there really hasn't been a whole lot of, uh, of hockey news that has been gone down. Um, NHL news, at least. There's plenty of hockey news when it comes to Hockey Canada, but that's a story for another day that we could chat about. But um, in terms of Leafs news, it's been bone dry. Nothing going on in uh, in Toronto land, which, which made us kind of think to ourselves, there's got to be like something has to give. There's like about five or six weeks or so until training camp. Something has to happen, right? So we have three burning questions that we have leading up to uh, leading up to training camp for the duration of the off season that we got to have that we want to try and answer ourselves, I suppose. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do that for you guys. But before we get to these questions. I am going to tell you about one of today's show sponsors. And that's, of course, one of our favorites. It's betonline.net. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your sports betting needs. Bet on all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting, scores, podcasts. They got you covered. Head to the Bets Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening. Bet online, it's where the game starts. Welcome back into the Locked On Leafs podcast. I'm Mike DiStefano. Got Dave Morissuti with me. We're hosts here at Locked On Leafs, and we've got three burning questions. For you guys, for ourselves, that we kind of want to walk through because, Dave, we don't think that the Leafs are done this summer. I mean, first of all, they can't be. They're over the cap, which ties into one of our questions. They still have uh, a big-named RFA unsigned, which 
also ties into one of our questions. And then we're kind of curious a little bit about what's going on with the, the, the prospect pool as well, which ties into our other question. So why don't we start up at the tippy top? I think one of the, the next order orders of business that I think the Maple Leafs need to try and figure out and what I think is the number one burning question is, what the heck is going on with Rasmus Sandin? You know, like, for a while I wasn't concerned about it. And I'm not necessarily, like, super concerned. I think it'll get done eventually. But, like, what what are we doing at this point? It's it's radio silence with this guy. He's an RFA. Um, and the Maple Leafs need to get him signed. Or maybe they try and move on from him, use him in a deal, whatever it may be. But right now, I think that is the the number one burning question, or that's got to be the next piece of business for Kyle Dubas is figure out what's happening with Rasmus Sandin. Do you agree with me, or or what do you think about that? Well, considering Leafs don't have a great track record of signing some of their RFAs before training camp begins, yeah. <laughs> I think you got some justification for wondering what the heck is going on here, like. I don't know if they're waiting for if if Kyle Dubas is trying to get a gauge on what other guys are uh, signing for. Like somebody mentioned that Oliver Collington, uh, Shillington, sorry, who just signed with Calgary, might be a good kind of high end of what a, a Sandy contract could be. Like there's a kind of an in between there. I can't remember where I saw. I saw it somewhere on Twitter there, but. I don't know what I don't know really what Kyle like what's changing in Rasmus Sandy's value from the end of the season till now like nothing's changed. I don't know if he's just waiting for another deal to come about that he's trying to make the cap space. But you can sign Sandy now. You can still be over the cap and then figure that out later. I don't know what exactly. I don't know if there's a specific order that Kyle Dubas is trying to work with here or or what. But yeah, well, I don't I don't like that that this. If this gets close to the training camp, I don't like the potential of like Erasmus Sandy not being there at the start of training camp if he is still with the team. I get the sense it's twofold. Like Sandy, A, I believe he wants and believes he should be compensated more than Timothy Lilligren. I think he thinks he's ahead of the curve on Lilligren and he got 1.4. Therefore, he believes he should get less. And I don't think the Maple Leafs see it that way. I think they see him kind of as a, a tandem, a duo. And he says, look, we gave Timothy to 1.4. Here's 1.4. Let me know when you're ready to sign it. Maybe that's why we haven't seen anything, because he's not ready to um, come down to that number yet. He thinks he deserves closer to the Oliver Shillington deal, who got $2.5 million. I believe Shillington's the better player of the two. Kurt, certainly right now he is. Maybe Sandine could get there. But if Shillington's making two and a half, Sandine ain't making two and a half. I'll tell you that right now. Um, but could he negotiate and get himself up to like one seven, one eight, potentially, maybe that's what he's trying to do. And he's trying to wait out Kyle Dubas and maybe take this into training camp. And we've seen what happens when, you know, Maple Leafs players take things late in, into the season and kind of hold out. Usually it turns out pretty well for the player. Uh, it's had a pretty good track record of that happening. So maybe that's what's going on. But if you'll recall too, um, he, he, he did come out and say that he wants opportunity and we've done this time and time again, where we've done this exercise, where we've looked at the lineup where we try and pencil him in as an everyday NHL -er, and we're just not sure it's there right now. Like on the left side, you've got Morgan Riley, Jake Muzzin and Mark Giordano. Yes. Rasmus Sandin can play the right side, but if you recall, Kyle Duba said he prefer to have Rasmus on his natural left side next season. Plus, where are you going to put him on the left side? If that's if you're going to put him on your third pair, okay, so you're moving Lilligren up, you're moving Hall up. Like, what are you doing here? You moving Brody around? Like, what? Where? Where is the fit? Right. So I think that's why there's so many different questions with Rasmus Sandin. It's where does he fit in the lineup? A and B. What type of contract is he looking for? I think we could say it's safe to assume that Dubas is trying to get, you know, him signed for as little as possible, considering they're already over the cap. So what is he looking for and how much is opportunity, which doesn't necessarily have an everyday role with this team right now? How much is that worth to him and how much are you going to have to bid up maybe to uh, for him to accept that 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 type of role? I don't know, but that seems to be where things are. At least that's my read on the situation. Uh, I don't see. I'm of the opinion too that if I was in Rasmus Sandin's shoes, you take the one year deal, 
you're still I know you, you want to try to get yourself in the best position for your next contract, but take that one year deal and you know, you kind of have that conversation with the lease manager saying, look, if I have this one year deal, if I've proved to myself to be an everyday NHLer, I'm not the next contract's not going to be so easy in that regard. Like if that's what my thinking is if I'm Rasmus Sandin, like you haven't really proven yourself yet as an everyday player. So your demands can't be of an everyday player. Now, he obviously views himself as an everyday player, so that's going to make his thinking and his beliefs a lot different than what we think it should be. So right now, I don't know if he's getting wrong advice. I don't know if he's just going to try to stick to what he wants and he's not going to move off it because he's seen that other players have been able to kind of squeeze a little bit and get at least close to what they want. But if I'm uh, if I'm Rasmus Sandy, if your desire is to play every day, and it doesn't matter if it's in Toronto or elsewhere, make that known to the Leafs. If your desire is to be with the Leafs, you got to understand that there's limitations on what they can offer you, both in opportunity and in contract. Because simply put, he has not put himself in a position to almost dictate what he wants. Yeah, and it almost seems as though now that they've gone out and they've brought in Callie Armcroak and they've given, um, you know, Pierre Engvall a big raise, it, it almost seems as though they've ran out of cap space to even use them as trade bait to bring in a like a a, a, a piece to help them now, right? Like that, that's where it does get a little confusing too, where it's okay, even as trade bait, what can you really get for this guy? How is he valued around the league? Is he maybe valued more by Toronto who, you know, used first round capital on him? Um, and, and, you know, even with that, now you got to make sure that you're trading him for somebody who doesn't carry a big cap hit themselves, which is not uh, easy to do. Obviously in today's age, no one's looking to, uh, to, to give up young cheap players, right? Like it's just, there's not a lot that they can really do at this point. Now with Rasmus Sandin, um, it's it's going to be interesting. So that's that's the number one burning question I have is what the hell happens with with Rasmus Sandin and when does that end up uh, getting settled? Um, why don't we take one more quick break? When we get back, we'll go through our second and third burning questions that we have through the off season. And you're listening to Locked On Lease Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Welcome back into Locked on Leafs. Uh, I'm Mike DiStefano with Dave Morissuti. We're your hosts here at the Locked on Leafs podcast. And uh, we got podcasts for you three times a week for the rest of the summer. And then right, we'll get right back into it once training camp starts up with daily shows once again. But please make sure that you are subscribed to us, whether it's audio form, wherever you get your, uh, uh, your podcast from, or check us out on video and subscribe there. Uh, on video format let us know in the comment section below if you're watching this on youtube let us know what you think ends up happening with rasmus sandine is he on this team does he get signed does he get dealt does he hold out let us know exactly what you think ends up happening with rasmus sandine or what you think should happen with rasmus sandine one of the next questions that david uh david and i have here going forward for the maple leafs is how are the Leafs going to get cap compliant? Because, uh, I mean, the, the Leafs typically are really good at this, but as it stands right now, they are $1.493 million over the cap, and they have 22 players counting against that cap. So that's one of the questions that I have. And it's not necessarily because, look, Dave, there, there's an easy way to answer this, I guess, and that would be, I'll send a couple of guys down to the minors that make, you know, make up one point, you know, four, three million dollars. And you can easily make that up. So send a couple of guys who make, you know, seven fifty or eight hundred grand, send them to the minors, and now you have your a 20 man roster. Sure, that's an easy way that you could look at it. Or is there a trade coming? What do you think, Dave? Do we still have like another move? in the cards here or do you think it'll be more of a we like our group we like the players we have the easiest thing to do is just to carry a roster of 20 players like we've done in the past to kind of get around 
um, get around the, the, the cap. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm of the belief that it should most likely be a trade because you discuss how much the Leafs are going to have to send down to be cap compliant. They can get to the 12 forwards if they send out a couple of forwards because they uh, they have 14 signed right now. They only have six defensemen. Are you going to carry six defensemen? And that's including, I think that includes Rasmus Sandin. No, 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 it doesn't. Not include. So would you would Rasmus Sandin figure in as your seventh defenseman? Um, I I think the trade route would be likely. I mean, we're going to bring up Alexander Kerfoot's name again because. You move three point five million, that gives you cap f- a little bit of cap flexibility because you'll be you'll gain some cap space. Because I think the Leafs are going to need to make sure that they have they can have the depth that they need up front and up front and on the back end. Like I don't see this as a situation where okay, we'll send a couple of guys down that'll make us cap compliant. Not I mean other than like a Wayne Simmons, Kyle Clifford, Joey Anderson, like. There aren't many guys where you can say, all right, he's going down. I mean, Kyle Clifford is, is an obvious one if you are going to send a forward down. Um, the problem with Kerfoot, too, and I keep forgetting this, is that he has a modified no-trade clause where he submits a 10-team no-trade yeah. list. So it's not like you can just trade him away to like the boonies of Arizona because he could just say, no, he's done, done on my list. You can't send me there. And he has every right to. That's contractually obligated the least have to follow that so it, that's the part that i'm struggling with here is that yeah we can they can send a few guys down but then if you need a guy in case of injury we have seen how difficult that can be because then you're playing shorthanded because you can't call a guy up because you don't have the cap space so that's why i think a trade route i don't know who it's going to be but it's going to be somebody because at least just they can't afford to have to constantly play that, you know, the shorthand role and they might be looking to make another move. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I'm with you. Like the, the, the two names that stick out to me, if they decide to keep this group together, if they say, no, we like Kerfoot, we like his versatility. We like what he brings to the roster, to the team. He's a good locker room guy. I'm pretty sure he's even like their PA rep, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Like he's a very well liked person within the organization, within the team. If they say he's a glue guy, we want to keep here, and they don't trade him. The players that stick out to me that you could still technically just send to the minors and roll with like no skaters in the press box. Literally, you dress 20 players in a game, so you carry 20 players on your team. Um, the two forwards that I would be looking to send down are probably, you know, Kyle Clifford is one, and then one of Wayne Simmons, Joey Anderson, or Adam Goddett. One of those three could easily get sent down. Um, that those are the, you know, kind of the four players, I guess. Uh, so where pick two of those four guys that you could send down, and I think that would be, um, that would make them cap compliant. Now, like you said it brings on risk because obviously if an injury occurs, you're on a road trip and an injury occurs, you can't call anybody up or if they're not injured long enough that you can't put them on, on IR, it's only going to be like a day to day thing. Well, now all of a sudden you got to play shorthanded and the Maple Leafs have been in that situation. And a lot of teams were the last couple of years with COVID where it's like, "Eh, you're up against the cap. Can't call anybody up because of it. And you know, COVID, unfortunately, didn't go on IR for whatever freaking reason. But anyways, um, and you could do an emergency recall for a game because you had to play one game shorthanded, which, again, I don't understand the point of that. But anyways, uh, <laughs> that's for another day. Uh, so, you know, it, it's it's risky to do it, but I could see I can envision a scenario where that's <clears throat> the route that they go in. But I'm with you. If I were in charge of the team i'd be looking to move out kerfoot salary three and a half million bucks only 750 grand in actual cash to um yes he's got a 10 team no trade list but that means there's 22 other teams that you can trade him to uh, and i would imagine that there's a couple of teams out there that might be interested in that player especially those who are still looking to get to the cap floor which there is a team that has not yet reached the cap floor and that is the Arizona coyotes, which there's a good chance Arizona's on his 10 team, no trade list. Although 
hey, good weather. Maybe he wouldn't mind going down there. But there are still so many teams that have like 19 million cap space, 18 million, 11, 11, 10 million dollars, 10 million dollars. Like there are so many teams that can afford to take on this deal. Um, and with a bit of a, you know, I, I feel as though there are teams that would be willing to bring him into the organization. And I've said this all along, the signing of Cali Yarncroft to me makes him expendable as well. He's a cheaper version of what, uh, of, of what Kerfoot can bring you. So that's what I would do. Um, Justin Hall is another option that you could potentially look to move on from as well. And yes, obviously there's always the potential that you, you, you find, figure out a way. Maybe Jake Muzzin is a guy who you, you look to move on from if something kind of comes up or if LA comes calling and he wants to go back there. But uh, yeah, ultimately I, I wouldn't be surprised if they go with the, the, uh, the send down route and roll with 20 skaters. But you know, obviously I think, best case scenario from an outsider's perspective is probably to move on from uh, like Alex Kerfoot, I would say. Um, the next question that we have, David, which prospects will be participating in the world junior championship? And funny enough, we actually have uh, some of the answers to that question. Would you like to explain uh, some of the players that will be featured at the summer edition of the World Junior Championships, the rescheduled ones uh, that will be taking place later this month that uh, we saw happen, uh, well, get canceled, I guess, due to COVID during the Christmas holidays. Um, yeah, so which Leaf players did you uncover that are going to be representing their countries, but also be Leafs representatives at the tournament? Yeah, so we got three. So the tournament begins on August the 9th. It's going back to Edmonton. Um no surprise, Matthew Nyes, when the U.S. trimmed their roster to 27, they have to get to 25 before the tournament starts, and they said that they expect to make that a final for August 7th. August 7th. If Matthew Nyes is not on that roster, I would think that every single person making decisions for Team USA Hockey will need to be fired because that would just be <laughs> blasphemy if he's not on the team. But he did, make, he did headline the guys that made that the big cut from their selection camp or their wasn't even really a selection camp. It was more of like a getting back to know each other sort of camp. So he was, uh, he's obviously the big name there for the Leafs. And I'm sure a lot of Leafs fans will be looking to see what Matthew Nyes can do. Um, and then we got the two Finnish guys that a lot of guys we've heard a lot about. We have Roni Hirvinen, who's been named to Finland and we got Toby Niemela, two guys who, are big parts of what Finland is trying to do and what they big part of their roster. So you, I would expect you're going to see a lot of those them to be, especially because they're both uh, veteran guys on, you know, I know veteran guys on a, on a U 20 tweet team, but that's essentially what they are. I can't believe we're the, within a week of this tournament starting back it, up. It came out of nowhere. It really did. Like when I saw Canada drop its roster the other day, I was like, Oh, it's coming out a little early, and then I'm like, oh, it's in a week. Never mind. That's about right to announce the roster. And, uh, yeah, I guess America, the Americans still want a couple more days to finalize theirs. But um, Ty Voigt, who was a Maple Leafs prospect, uh, was cut from Team USA camp, so he will not uh, be representing uh, USA at the World Junior Championships. He was somebody who had a really good season in the OHL this year, and we thought had a good chance to make it with some of the other Americans deciding to uh, kind of go pro um, instead of returning to Team USA. Ryan Tverberg, another player from the Canadian camp who didn't make it the second time around, and uh, Fraser Minton was at the – uh, Canadian selection camp as well, if I'm not mistaken, did not end up on the final roster either. So there's a couple of guys who had some opportunities, made it close, got a little sniff at uh, the World Junior Championships, but ultimately it's going to be the least, you know, top three prospects right now. Matthew Nyes, Topi Nimala, and Roni Irvinen that uh, will be kind of keeping an eye on and, and have a little bit of a rooting interest for when they're not playing Team Canada. I will say that uh, that with pride. Go, Canada. Go. Um, although. We want to see your guys kind of do well as well. 
No, it's not that. It's just like, you know, there's some rocky stuff with Hockey Canada right oh, now. Yeah. Unless you really want to see the success at this point. That's going to be an interesting situation with all that going on. And uh, meanwhile, the, the tournament will be ongoing in uh, in Alberta. That should be – that'll be interesting. But like I said, that, that's a conversation we can have um, on another day. Why don't we wrap this thing up here, Dave? Uh, good show. Good to be back for the week. We'll come back tomorrow with another podcast. I'd like to thank you all for listening and supporting the show. You can subscribe to the Locked on These Podcasts on all podcasts and platforms and receive daily Leafs content. Follow myself on Twitter at Mickey underscore Canuck. Follow Dave at D underscore more suited. You can follow the show as well at Locked on Leafs. Go ahead, smash that like button if you're here on YouTube. Leave us a comment down below. Um, let us know your thoughts about anything that we had to say on today's podcast. And uh, if you could, if you're listening on iTunes, leave a rating and review as well. That would be much, much appreciated. Help us rise up those iTunes charts, which we're trying to do each and every week. All right, we'll be back with another episode tomorrow. We're going to do a fun little exercise. We're going to build the perfect leaf. Yes, build the perfect leaf. We'll tell you more about it on tomorrow's show. But until then, keep it locked right here on Locked On Leafs.